Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us during this hectic holiday season for today's special Open Mind program, our very last one of 2023. I'm Vicki Goodman, and it is my honor to introduce today's esteemed presenters. Joining us from her home in Chicago is Dr. Devorah Heitman, a renowned expert on kids and technology and author of the best-selling new book, Growing Up in Public, Coming of Age in a Digital World. Dr. Heitner is also the author of ScreenWise, Helping Kids Thrive and Survive in Their Digital World. Her writing on kids and technology has been featured in prestigious publications such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN Opinion, and Fast Company. She earned her PhD in Media Technology and Society from Northwestern University and is the parent of a teenager, which makes her uniquely qualified to speak on teens and screens, a phrase coined by Dr. Yalda Yules, adjunct professor at UCLA and founder and executive director of UCLA Center for Scholars and T Storytellers, who will join Dr. Heitner in discussion. Dr. Yules is an internationally recognized research scientist, educator, author, and expert on the science of media and adolescent development, the importance of diversity, equity, inclusion, and the evolving nature of parenting. Her expertise on how media content is created, along with the science of how media affects children, informs her unique perspective and her, is her inspiration for creating UCLA's Center for Scholars and Storytellers. Dr. Yule's career bridges the worlds of entertainment and psychological research. She was a movie executive at MGM and Sony who earned an MBA and a PhD from UCLA. She now serves as an adjunct professor at UCLA and is the author of Media Moms and Digital Dads, a fact not fear approach to parenting in the digital age. She is also the proud daughter of Persian immigrants. For those of you who are new to the open mind, this is our free lecture and film series that brings together thought leaders at the intersection of culture and science for meaningful and relevant programs about mental health issues. The open mind is proudly sponsored by the Friends of the Semmel Institute and the Resnick Neuropsychiatric Hospital Board of Advisors. And on the behalf of both boards, I would like to thank our, both of our speakers for taking the time for their busy schedules to be with us today. Just a few housekeeping notes. Today's program will run for approximately one hour. The last segment will be reserved for your questions. If you would like to ask either of our speakers a question, we ask that you please type it into the Q&A, which is located at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we will do our best to get to as many questions as possible during the time allotted. Uh, today's program is being recorded. You may view it on our website, friendsofsemmelinstitute.org, where you will also find a library of videos from past Open Mind programs and WOW the Mental Health Summit also a calendar of upcoming Open Mind events and special events, including our Teen Advisory Council's inaugural Gen Z Wellness Summit, which will be held in person on Sunday, February 25th at UCLA, and the Open Mind Film Festival for high school students that will be held in person this year, also at UCLA, and live streamed on Sunday, April 21st. Again, details can be found on our website, friendsofsemmelinstitute.org. And now, please join me in giving a warm Zoom welcome to Dr. Devorah Heitner and Dr. Yalda Yules. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and Vicki and Wendy, and I'm very excited about that Gen Z Summit. And I think, Devorah, you're going to start by talking about the book, right? Absolutely. So I've been on the road talking with kids and families about these issues for the last 10 years. And although I think I reassured a lot of people with, with my first book, ScreenWise, uh, because they, I was able to kind of help people maybe see different ways of looking at screen time and even maybe disrupt the use of that term, which is not a term I'm really fond of, and help 
educators and parents think differently about the ways kids are using tech, one of the persistent questions I still got in those years, kind of before the pandemic, if we can remember back to, you know, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, people were already pretty immersed. Teens were already quite one with their phones, even before the pandemic. Make no mistake about it. It was already happening. But the pandemic, of course, really thrust all of us into kind of a next level immersion. And in that time, I was already getting a lot of questions about what about reputation? What about the fact that my kid can potentially share something about themselves that will stick with them like glue? What about, what if their friends video them when they're drunk and they say something really out of line that then is associated with them forever? We never had to deal with that. And a lot of parents said to me, if I had had somebody following me around with a video camera all the time, it would not have been good. So I really wrote growing up in public to kind of address those concerns to learn what it feels like to even be a teenager today with that reputation threat kind of hanging over one's head. And I'm very eager to be in the conversation with Yalda because I know she's been in this, it, you know, in, in this same space for a long time and also really listening to young people. And I think that together we are not in the gloom and doom side of things. And we also both really, I think, like and respect young people. And I think a lot of the conversations around this tend to be get into this kind of generation bashing that I think is really unhealthy. So I'll stop there. And Yalda, do you want to say a little bit about your work? And then we can dive into a conversation. Yeah, I'm so excited to be talking with you, Devorah. We 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 both wrote our uh, first, my first book and only book and Devorah's other book, Screenwise, at the same time. And we've been thinking and studying this stuff for a long time. Um, so you heard my background. I was a movie exec, and then I got a PhD in developmental psychology, and then I launched the Center for Scholars and Storytellers, which is based at UCLA. And it's really, um, we sit at the intersection of science, entertainment, and um, and adolescence. And we really focus on how we can support the people who create content and stories for young people, how to support them with research insights so that they can better um, reflect the lived experiences of adolescence. So love adolescence. We are very, you know, I'd like to say we're balanced. Um, you know, I mean, sometimes people think um, if you're balanced and you're not bashing media, then you are um, actually, you know, rah-rah cheerleader. But the reality is I'm a mom of two. Um, I went through, and when I was getting my PhD, um, it was the ultimate in project-based learning. I was studying media and how media impacts um, tweens and teens. And I my kids were tweens and teens. So I was actually um, really practicing and learning and scared very scared of what my kids were doing, you know, staring at screens, um, playing video games. But as they grew up and as the research base um, increased and as I saw my kids turn out fine and, you know, I started really understanding the research and we started really studying the research and the research really does not point to a causation between screens and mental health. There may be some amplification amplification in certain cases, but it is not necessarily the thing that's, you know, leading to the mental health crisis, um, contrary to popular belief. So um, I think that um, you, Deborah, you work a lot with um, young people and you work with educators. And can you share with me what are some of the things that you hear from educators, from young people, and from parents about their greatest concerns around kids in tech today? Yeah, a lot of the concern is about the ways young people are surveilled by one another and about the ways they opt in to sharing about themselves and potentially compromise their own privacy. There's not, I think, as much concern about the way parents may be compromising kids' privacy or maybe surveilling kids. And so that's one of the things I really learned in writing growing up in public that, yes, kids are quite surveilled, um, but parents and educators are contributing to that surveillance, whether we're checking grades multiple times a day or multiple times a week, tracking kids' locations, uh, surveying their own posts and even reading kids' texts and all of the tech enabled kind of spying we can do as parents and even as educators in schools is thought to be or kind of it's it's presented to adults as a way of caring for kids as a way of supporting kids a way of keeping kids safe but we see again and again the ways that it can also really 
impinge on their independence and impinge on their sense of identity and sense of well-being. And it's tricky. And I I want to come back to what you said about if you're balanced, that means you're pro-media, because I'm not here to be an apologist for any of the big companies that do social media, for example. I think it's complicated, right? I certainly think that there's a reason that, you know, states and schools are suing these companies, right? I don't necessarily know if that's going to bring us the the the, the desired results, but I absolutely understand why users are frustrated with these companies. And I think, so when parents are coming to me with the, that concern, like is Instagram, is Snapchat, is TikTok, is Discord harming my child's mental health? And they may not be thinking as much about is Bark, is Life360, is, you know, can the Canvas grading app or another, you know, grading app, another learning management system, is that harming their mental health? Is the ability for my kid to check their GPA every hour on the hour good for them? Yeah, actually, you know, I have a personal story where I, I, um, I, when I gave my child her phone, I said, you know, I can look at your texts whenever I want. And this is my phone. I'm paying for it. You know, I was, I was a tough parent. I was good. And I did actually check her texts and, and I shared with her some concerns about her text cut to 10 years later. She tells me that is the one sort of most disappointing thing that she, that I did as a parent. And um, it really betrayed our trust and our relationship and, and, you know, when you are spying and it may not feel like spying, but to your child, to an adolescent, their job is to develop autonomy, develop their identity, separate from the adults in their lives so they can survive in the world without you. I mean, if you go back evolutionary, they were leaving our homes, you know, pretty young and they're staying with us later, but biologically they are really supposed to learn how to how to connect with peers and that's what they're doing with this stuff then you know then you are not spying on them what are they feeling what are they you know what are they learning not only is that harming their mental health but how is it harming your relationship with them are you building trust you know because ultimately that's how you're going to be have the best relationship um with your child um and I wonder what, if you have a comment on that. Yeah, I mean, ideally, we're mentoring our kids even before they get their phones. And I, you know, I think early on with the phone, looking at it with them can be a way of mentoring. And especially now, like our kids, I mean, my kid is almost 15. I know your kids are even older than that. Like mm -hmm. my my sense is that a lot of, and, and Pew said Center for Internet and American Life and other research centers tell us that kids are getting phones at nine or 10. And I you know, I think like, should you look at your nine-year-old's text? Should you know who their contacts are? Like probably. So I do think it's very different when we're talking about an adolescent and the developmental phase of a 15 or 16 or 17 year old versus a nine-year-old texting on their first watch. So I just want to be clear that I don't think that all supervision is overly invasive developmentally, but I do think tracking a 17 year old's whereabouts, reading their texts to their, you know, boyfriend or girlfriend or best friend, like all of that seems incredibly invasive. Um, somewhere along the way, we need to back off. But if we are letting kids text at eight, at nine, the ideal is that they know that we're looking and that we're doing it with them. What we don't want to engage in, I think at any age, is covertly looking at our kids' stuff and and not doing it you know, for any, for any particular reason. I mean, the only exception, again, that I would give and knowing that we're in a mental health focused space um, is I talked to the suicidality, um, you know, prevention expert, Jonathan Singer for the book. And he said, yes, if you're in a really red light kind of situation where you, you think you have strong reason to believe your child's life is at stake, that might be a reason to go through their phone. Literally, if you think, you know, if, if you can't get your kid an inpatient bed any other way, but you can show that they've been speaking about a plan, for example, with others, that would be something you could do. And yes, it's a violation of trust. So it's a big step to take. But if that's, you know, in between, you know, basically a life-saving thing, but don't do it because you're curious or because they haven't opened up to you about who they sit with at lunch these days, like they used to in second grade, like that's a developmental change that's healthy and makes sense and is typical. So it's tricky because as parents, we're so used to being on the inside. And even as I write about in, in the book, like these apps, like Class Dojo are giving us so much information about our child's day in elementary school that it can be hard to adjust to having less information as they mature. Um, what are you seeing about this, Yelda, since you've written so much about how kids are interpreting television and mainstream media? Like, 
what are you seeing uh, about this topic kind of, you know, like, I mean, I think about shows like Never Have I Ever, where like the mother maybe is like doing some things like spying on the phone. Like, what do you, what do you see? How, do, how does this play out in stories that we see in television? Well, it's funny. Yesterday, we, we did a presentation at a movie studio and we um, talked about our teens and screens. I did not come up with that phrase, by the way. I think it, I'm sure it, it existed in the lexicon. We just used it for our study. Um, but this was a study of 1500 teens from across the country um, and it got a lot of press. Um, so we were presenting it to a movie studio and they um, and then we did an interviews with some adolescents, Gen Z kids. And um, we were asked they uh, people asked them what they wanted to see about media. And actually, in our study, we asked, asked the young people, how do you use social media? How does it inspire you? The number one way they used it was to learn a new hobby. Um, mm -hmm. They were also talking about activism also, and this was, you know, 10 to 25, but the older teens, of course. Um, but one of them said, when we were talking about how it shows up in movies, um, you know, and what were their pet peeves about, um, about the way that texting shows up in movies, they said they hate the way people write texts in screenplays in these shows and that it does not reflect the way young people communicate at all. And they commu communicate completely differently on text than they do face-to-face. -face. It is a completely different language. And if you think about it, right, it's all lowercase, it's all BRB, you know, all these words that you would never say in the real world. But sometimes adults were like applying our sort of older communication patterns to this newer communication mode and judging it. And yet they, you know, they've adjusted, they've learned social norms, the older adolescents in particular, that we just don't understand because we didn't grow up with it. Well, so that, that's um, what makes intergenerational texting so tricky where like you say, okay, period. And your kid is like, why are you mad at me? Because and they're like, well, you <laughs> yeah. said, okay, period. Yeah. You know, which is like has implications and you're, yeah. you know, and most of us olds are like, what? Yeah. Um, I liked Heartstopper. I wrote about Heartstopper mm -hmm. last year when another really great book about kids and screens came out behind their screens um, from uh, Carrie Weinstein and- uh, No, Emily Weinstein. Emily Carrie Weinstein, James. thank you. And Carrie, <laughs> what is the other author's name, Carrie? Carrie James and Emily Weinstein. Thank you. I'm not looking at the book right now, but their research is really thoughtful and specifically about texting. They got a lot of great data about wait times, like how kids will wait a certain amount of time to respond and not appear over eager. And I thought that was really interesting uh, and resonated with some things that I had heard, but they had a lot more sort of quantity to their, their study on texting in particular. Like I had a few sort of qualitative stories like that. Um, but Heartstopper, you see the kids waiting and you see them watching the three dots and kind of hanging on someone else's. And then as the relationships change, both the romantic relationships and friendship relationships change and get more confident and comfortable, you see a much more rapid pace and kids are not, they're not like waiting and, and thinking as much about what they text. Yeah. But I thought their book does a nice job kind of showing that nervous experience of starting a new friendship or romantic relationship and the, the freighted ways that we text. And again, in, in, in adulthood, we have some of that as well, but I think most of us have histories with the people we're texting that might even predate texting. So it's yeah. not what? the way we're getting to know texting? people. I'm not that old. <laughs> So uh, you talk a lot about uh, monitoring versus mentoring. Um, and and I, you know, I actually, I've been talking to Emily Weinstein and a few other people um, about how to sort of come up with ways to think about, because parents just are so scared and they, you know, uh, many, many parents think they're doing a good job of parenting their child's media world if they restrict it, if they, you know, if they spy, if they restrict, if they put a strict time limit all of these things that people who study it, people who talk to young people, you know, say are not necessarily the best ways to parent in the media world. Um, and so we're thinking about different framing and, and monitoring and mentoring is a really interesting way to do it. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, I mean, mentoring is a lot of work and kids are going to make mistakes when we mentor. And part of mentoring is helping them you know, reclaim reputation, move forward, deal with the consequences. Like maybe they said something that kind of blew up in their friend group, or they shared something that got them into trouble. And I see some of the questions kind of going into that territory, pushing back on the like, don't spy. So I think we should kind of 
but mm-hmm. make sure we get to those. But mm-hmm. I do think it's important to also talk about just our own experiences. So much of our lives now we're thumbing out in front of our kids rather than making phone calls like my parents did that I could overhear and I could hear how my mother dealt with conflict. I could hear how she got off the phone with someone. I could hear how she spoke to someone she didn't know versus someone she knew well. Our kids aren't seeing any of that. They're not hearing that, right? Because we're thumbing out those aspects of our lives. We don't have a shared family phone where they're hearing those conversations take place. So a lot of the um, the the empathy that we bring to a, a decision like, oh, well, let's not tell grandma that news until we're there because I don't want her to give her that news by text when she's alone or even call her. I want to wait till we're there in person, that kind of thing. That's something we're thinking about in our heads, but we need to ideally spell some of those decisions out Mm -hmm. for young people, whether we have eight-year-olds or 17-year-olds, because they're going to be in these situations where they have to do it, but they're not getting as much chance to learn from us. Mm -hmm. Mentoring can also be learning from our kids. Say you don't know Discord or TikTok very well. Some of mentoring could be having them teach you the app, but then you can also see maybe what the challenges could be for them. And you might have different concerns about a kid who's impulsive versus a kid who maybe has other challenges, right? And so just noticing uh, what opportunities and challenges each app can present. You know, if you know you have a kid who's who's already kind of struggling around body image, you can imagine that Instagram might be challenging. And so just having them show you how the app works, how they're using the app, it also might reassure you. A lot of kids who use Instagram are using it to message and not necessarily to post. And so it might actually be less concerning than you imagine. Uh, so that that's a huge part of mentoring. Ultimately, we want to set kids up for success independently because we're not going to be there when they're living on their own and to take away their phones at night or to help them respond to an inappropriate text. So we need to help them navigate those situations when they're still with us so that they can have practice mm-hmm. and including practice, falling down, messing up, fixing situations that are difficult. Yeah, I think I told you uh, my my one of my children was reading your book. We got um sent it and found it found that it resonated so much and really did sort of think about you know what are the consequences of, you know, basically how this new world where it's not even I have an aura ring. I don't know if anyone knows that. It's spying on me right now. It's not just, you know, and it basically tracks everything, you know, and the ring outside the, the um, ring alarm and the phone and the, you know, and the light things and the, you know, the Alexa and the Google. Um, what do you hear from young people who are they really thinking about this or they sort of have given up? You know, I mean, when I was telling a friend about my ring and how it was a little creepy, she was like, I don't care. I'm being tracked everywhere. So who cares? And these kids, it's happening, you know, but, but so what do you tell them? What do you, what do parents tell them? What do you, yeah, I mean, do they, feel? they, it's interesting that location tracking freaks them out less than reading their texts. I would say reading their texts is like the number one that feels the most invasive, partly because you're learning about their friends and not just them. Right. And so, and some kids even feel like if their parents are extensively reading their texts, people won't talk to them because they know, right? Yeah. So, you, you know, you can have a kid who gets dropped from a group text if like mom is reading the group text and is like going to, the you know, report everything that happens in the group text or kind of following up with other parents and kind of like blowing things up in the friend group, then that can be an issue. And so that's, I see that more in like a middle school situation. Um, and, you know, but I, I would definitely tell your middle schooler that someone's parents are likely, especially a sixth grader, you know, someone's parents probably are on the group text. So that's good for them to think about. Uh, We need our kids to be realistic about how much privacy they have or don't have. Mm -hmm. So, and then as they, as they get older, we want to really think about, um, you know, what, what are the ways that we can help them navigate things going wrong? And things are going to go wrong. So even just asking them, like, when have you seen someone posting that seemed totally out of type for them, that seemed very different than how they present or very unaligned. And when we talk with kids, I really think we should not, not emphasize getting in trouble as much as emphasizing, is this aligned with who you are? Could someone misunderstand who you are by reading this? If we emphasize getting in trouble and particularly things like college admissions, we're really having the wrong conversation. Mm-hmm. If we say to kids, you won't get into Stanford if you post that, having the wrong conversation because most kids won't get caught and Stanford isn't really doing a deep dive. No school is really doing a deep dive onto your social. But more importantly, you're saying to kids, don't get caught. 
You're not yeah. saying to get, be a good person, or if that joke might not be funny, or if that joke is harmful, or if that meme seems to be racist, don't share it because you're targeting people, individuals, or a group of people, right? Well, and that's I do think that, do. yeah, that that's totally true. But but you know what what is happening though, and what can happen, and you know all of us, you know, who in my own daughter's friend group, high school group, there was a horror story of of somebody posting something and you know, sending it to a FINSA and somebody getting a screenshot and then somebody seeing it that was, you know, unhappy with it and putting out, out a, the world as a social justice thing and every single one of them having some issues with their college. So on some level, it is a real concern and it's not about posting it. I think, you know, it's shifted. It's not about, hey, they had a drink or, you know, they, they smoked a joint at a party. It's really about these values and these sort of more, you know, so really having those conversations with them, uh, because if they're posting about race, this was a racist thing these girls posted. And, you know, if they're doing sexist things, you know, things that are, you know, triggers for colleges across the country, and also just, you know, they can become pu public. Um, having those conversations about who that, who you are, and what you're posting and that reflecting really the way, you know, and not trying to be funny with your friends and thinking it's funny and no one's going to see it because there are actually consequences that do happen. Absolutely. There are consequences, but it's more important to tell kids that you don't want to do harm than to tell kids again, that you won't get into college because many, many people share things like that and do get into college. So it's wrong information. And more importantly, say you're say we talk about the kids who got rescinded from Harvard because they were joking about the Holocaust. We're missing the point if we focus that they got rescinded from Harvard. Exactly. The focus should be that they thought genocide was like a funny joke exactly. and that that would that would be like a funny joke to tell. So what we need to do is make sure that kids understand history, they understand the weight of what they're saying, and they understand that things can be taken out of context. Now, Dashka Slater's new book, Accountable, does an amazing job really x-raying a situation in California, Albany, California, where a group of boys created an a Instagram account that was racist, that was very intended, you know, just to be an in thing just for them. And it's a, it's a complicated story uh, for many reasons. And she did a really great job reporting it so that you understand the targets, the perpetrators, how everyone felt. And the effect that it had on all of them for years. But what I would get out of that book, and, that the re and it's a YA book, you can, you know, teenagers can read it, school libraries should be giving it to kids. And I think they are. I think the book's doing really well and people are reading it. Um, but the, 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 the harm to the people who were targeted is so clear, even though the boys really believed that they were just being funny. Like they didn't get how harmful it was. And so I think reading that book would be really helpful. And again, the consequence, which some of them were kicked out of their high school yeah. might be what scares kids. But I would hope that the empathy of recognizing actually they really hurt those people. And some of them were ostensibly their friends. And that's what's like hard to grok as an adult is they believe they could make these jokes and that they could stay friends with these people and that that would be okay. It's just kind of some magical adolescent thinking. But it's really important that we read books like that with our kids and understand that the culture is really pushing kids toward like this edgy humor that's very harmful. So yeah, rather than emphasize again, like these bad things will happen to you. I mean, you can share those stories, but I think it's more important to share how harmful it is and to just think twice before we post anything. Yeah. And I think, I mean, you, you know, yeah, I'm very aware of that story and you could sort of see like, you know, the kids that were telling the jokes were actually trying to impress a certain group, you know, they thought they, that guy would like them. It's, it's same old developmental adolescent di dynamics, but they have this new tool that could lead them down a path that can really hurt others and also, you know, be dangerous. They got kicked out of their schools. It became a lawsuit. I think there was all sorts of things that happened, but I think that, um, I think the fact that the way to do it and the way to sort of think about it and because kids are kids, their brains are developing and also 
it's it requires perspective taking which is hard at any age to be able to put yourself in the other person's shoes like and that's hard to do even if you're staring at them in the face but if you're communicating over a phone or in you know in an asynchronous way it's even harder to do so it really is important when your child is young and you're first giving them the phone and the device particularly if you're starting at that young age to do it with them to spend some time you know when you first give them their device, that's when you have the most power and the most ability for them to listen to you, particularly if you haven't waited till every other kid has a phone and then they're resentful because they're the only one that hasn't. But if you give them a device and you talk to them and say, look, I'm going to follow you, I won't comment. The, the main thing is you have to protect your child's um, own reputation with their friends, because if they think, you know, it's going to be embarrassing to them if, if if an adult in their lives is commenting. And so you can have those conversations with them offline and also don't have them with them in this in this um, overbearing, um, angry way. Because like, for example, there's a lot of research that shows if a child has been bullied, they don't want to go and tell an adult because they cyber bullied, the adult is going to immediately want to take the phone away. And so they won't share it. But if you have a relationship with your child where your child knows I can come to you and I can talk to you and you aren't going to judge me for, you know, what happened and you're going to try to support me and help me and you're not going to take away the tech, they're going to share more with you and you're going to be able to help them. So if you do it when they're very young, though, when they're first getting on, like my daughter posted a few things that she just didn't have the developmental, she wasn't in the stage where she could really understand the, you know, not only in person perspective taking, but the fact that everybody in the world could see what she was posting. And I would talk to her about it. And, you know, so after a while, she was ready for me to no longer be involved. But in the beginning, it's really, really critical. And universally, our kids are growing up with these records. So everyone who, you know, runs for Congress is going to have a record of their TikTok dances. Like, this is the thing. I mean, we are all going to be surrounded by these these records. So I interviewed recruiters for companies for growing up in public to say, like, are you know, are we really dinging people for what they post? And they said it's mostly it would be those kinds of more socially problematic things. It's not you're drinking with a red cup that like you went to a party and you had a drink in college or something. Because they're, the recruiters I interviewed were like 28. So they all were very recently graduated themselves and they could still relate to the experience of the people they're recruiting. Um, I want to get to some of these questions, but I, I don't know, want to I was just gonna, other things. just going to bring up two of them because yeah. one is the sharenting one and the other one is the modeling. So yeah. Leslie says, does it help for parents to model the behavior they want their child to imitate? Some parents are glued to their phones and sharenting, which is also modeling, posting your child everywhere without any, um, any like re re thinking about their privacy. So what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> so sharenting, you know, I have a chapter on sharenting and growing up in public. I, I think most parents kind of haven't thought a lot about what we post about our kids and the internet can be an incredible source of community for parents and parenting can otherwise be so isolating. So I'm very empathetic to why parents want to post about our kids and we want to seek support in communities from parents, but we really need to think about our kids as autonomous beings who will have thoughts about how they were shared and also their own peers who may judge them or tease them for things that we share about them, sometimes out of timelines, you know, like we might share something when they're six and then they're in seventh grade and somebody's teasing them about the time you posted your kid with, you know, their chicken underpants on their head when they were, you know, seven. And you might not have thought about the fact that that was on your timeline anymore, but now that your kid is in seventh grade. So I think it's really important to recognize that we need to think about the most self-conscious our kids will ever be, which is like 13 for a lot of kids or around there. And not leave things out there that will make them feel embarrassed. And the other dimension to this that I don't get into as much in the book, but is interesting right now is facial recognition. So we have to kind of think about also how the technology changes, how all of us may or may not want to share our images as much. But just in terms of the relationship with our kids, a home should be a safe space and asking permission from our kids, which I've been saying since ScreenWise and even before, also models a consent-based relationship with sharing that's very positive for kids because then they know they can say no, they know they can have boundaries, they feel safe at home, they don't feel like they're going to be shared without permission, which is very violating. And in terms of modeling, all of us 
can model a more mindful relationship with tech, whether, you know, you texted and drove that one time in front of your kid, whether you, you know, are telling your kid no tech at mealtimes, but you just check your phone just that one time. I think it's so important to try to practice what we preach and then acknowledge when it doesn't happen and say, oh yeah, I really shouldn't do that. Okay. I'm going to stop, you know, and just Mm -hmm. name it. Mm -hmm. Because I think if we don't, our kids think we that we think we got away with it or that we didn't notice the hypocrisy of that. And even for our little kids, if we're sleeping with our phones, if they're the last things we see before we shut our eyes and the first things we see when we wake up, and that may feel necessary for many of us, our caregivers, for elders or other people in our lives. But it's really important that we recognize we're teaching our kids that that's what you do. And so when they get a phone, they're going to think they're going to sleep with it unless we cultivate another set of expectations, which is why, you know, with winter holidays in progress now and com more coming up, like I'll just say, if you're planning to get your kid that first phone, I think it's not an ideal surprise. I would set expectations in advance. Other gifts make a better surprise. With phones, I think it's best to, you know, have kids manage expectations beforehand. You don't want to hand it over and then be like, but you can't have Snapchat or, you know, you're not keeping it in your room. Like that should be something they know before they get it, because otherwise you're going to have a very happy moment of elation followed by tears. Yeah. And we, you know, I mean, uh, when I used to speak to parents all the time, we talk about family agreements, which I think still are very helpful where, and if you search online, the American Academy of Pediatrics has one you could shape through a digital tool. You know, there are, what they do is they help you sort of talk through what those expectations are. And because it's sometimes really impossible as a parent to figure out like all the things the kids might want to do. So you can say, you know, are we sleeping with it? Are we, you know, are we checking content with, with someone before we download an app? Are, are you giving me passwords? What are my, what am I doing as a parent as well? You know, so you also have a responsibility. I, I agree that I won't do this, or we all put it away when we're at the dinner table and that is our sacred time together. Um, these kinds of things can really, really help you have a thoughtful conversation if you um, are giving your child a phone. Absolutely. Yeah, these want, are yeah. Th these are really important. Go questions. ahead. Why don't you choose one? Even though we're supposed to so, wait. For I mean, the spying time. advice is hard to follow, right? And so I want to really address that. So, what do you if you know your kid is engaging in risky behavior? I mean, first of all, if you know your kid is at risk or their mental health is going through something, ideally, you're working with a third person in the relationship, like a therapist, whether it's a counselor at school or a community based mental health professional. Because at that point, your kid may need someone else that they can speak to without you. There may be ways that your relationship is somehow getting in the way, despite, you know, your good intentions. And so, and a lot of adolescents respond well to having not, not their caregiver or someone else to talk to. I would say even, you know, ideally a, like a typical adolescent going through typical adolescent ups and downs should still ideally have access to a counselor at some point. Right. And if it's more than that, absolutely. So that's a situation where you could talk about like, okay, you have repeatedly used your phone in ways that are not safe. Like say you had a kid underage using dating apps and meeting strangers and hooking up, right? Like I've talked to families where that's going on and they're like, shouldn't we take away the phone? And I'm like, well, that's a really unsafe situation, right? Maybe the phone needs to be used in a very limited way um, and then built back up to a more trusting situation. But that's also, again, a situation where I would come up with that agreement with a third party because it's gone beyond you know, a sort of, I would say like a typical, like a typical situation might be like you caught your kid texting at 1 a.m. with their best friend and you told your kid to charge their phone and not in their bedroom and they're not supposed to have it at 1 a.m. They're supposed to be asleep, right? I don't think that's a necessarily like you're immediately going to mental health support if that happens like one time. That's a pretty typical kind of like I'm experimenting with the boundaries. My mom said to put it away and I didn't, right? Because um, I felt like my conversation was more important, which is, makes a lot of sense for adolescents because their conversations do feel incredibly important with their friends. And sleep, which we know is incredibly important, feels like a fairly low priority. But if your kid is repeatedly doing something that's dangerous, again, working with a mental health professional and then figuring out a boundary, whether maybe the phone does need to be handed to the parent at night, maybe it is a more limited phone for a short period of time, a phone that has less capability um, there are not many situations where I would advocate locking down a phone. Another situation would be a pornography addiction where maybe you do give your kid a lockdown phone. And I've, I've talked to families where, uh, and again, my PhD is in media studies, not in psychology. So this is not me. Like I'm, I don't give counseling therapy to families at all. I do not diagnose. I don't do anything like that. But when families say to me, my kid is addicted to porn and they've told me, I'm like, how wonderful that your child trusts you enough to let you know that they're struggling with this. 
And these are some steps you can take, again, working with a mental health professional, but also, um, and, and I, I talk, uh, I, I use um, the respect model in the book of talking about pornography that um, I can, I can pull, it's, it's a research organization that uh, addresses pornography use in particular, but there are ways that we want to talk to our kids about that. It's a sensitive topic. Kids feel a lot of shame if they've been using pornography. It doesn't feel good to have to admit that that they're using porn and that they're, especially if they feel like they can't stop. But that's a situation where locking down a phone might make sense because that's a kid, you know, say you have a 15 or 16 year old, like literally like their bus pass, their school ID is on their phone. You know, my kid needs a QR code to get into school events in the evening. So completely cutting a kid off from a phone would make it very hard for them to operate, especially as a high schooler um, with any kind of independence. That said, they may need to have a more restricted phone for a time to help them build back. But what I would, I would add to that is I do think that sometimes what we think is alarming and scary and, and a huge issue um, may not require a, a strong reaction. So the first time a kid sees porn, they often find it just because by accident and they do feel shame. And if you react really negatively and overbearingly, they will not share it with you again. So really sort of thinking through your, your first reactions to things that may go wrong on social media or in their media habits, because that will set the tone for later on. Um, And I also think that um, really in the beginning, setting these expectations, coming to your child, allow coming to them in the beginning. So if there's something that they do, somebody said somebody something about it, uh, somebody said a boy said something inappropriate. Okay, if he's done that over and over and over again, and you talk to him two or three times, then you may want to take a more drastic step. But if it's one time and have a conversation with them, give them the benefit of the doubt. They just said something stupid. They just didn't understand. They're young. They're figuring things out. Um, You know, don't approach it with a really heavy hand in the beginning, or you will shut off communication. And communication is incredibly important. And you want to help them learn to be autonomous, learn to be able to make these better decisions on their own and not always have you there. Um, so Vicky, did, are you coming yeah, on? To, and how, to and how sort of, how sort of like dumb is it typical for adolescents to behave? It's like pretty dumb. Yeah. <laughs> like a lot of the time, like the things they will do are not things adults would do and not what you would sort of expect. But if you really, and a lot of us protectively don't remember that time in our lives well, but really think about like the dumbest, meanest thing you said in eighth grade or like the most, and it just wasn't well, shared. We can't remember that's the thing it that the we time. have is it wasn't videotaped. It wasn't shared. It wasn't recorded, but like, you know, I mean, I, I think of eighth grade, for example, as like a nader for me developmentally. And so when people are like, Oh, wait until eighth for a phone, I'm like, really eighth grade. Yeah, that may not be the best. When they're younger, you actually have time to help them a little learn the norms. Vicki. (laughs) First, before we get to the questions, and we have many here, I want to thank you both for this fascinating and informative discussion. You've given us so much information to process and incorporate into our well, for me, it's grandparenting, but for others, it's parenting, but just the relationship between tech and teens. And um, thank you for sharing all of that. Um, I do. Where There was a question here. It seems to have disappeared, but I would like to delve into it a little bit. It was from uh, one of our viewers who I believe is a psychiatrist at the Semmel Institute, Stephanie. Um, there's, there is some research that shows that social media can be harmful to mental health. And I know that you both had said um, earlier that overall it isn't, but I wonder if you could expand a little bit on that, because I know there a lot of parents have a great deal of concerns about what is this actually doing to my child's mental health. Oh, there's Lori Getz. Hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> So um, I was the one that talked about the research. So there is research, it's mixed. The evidence is mixed. There are some research that shows there's no relationship. There's some some research that shows there is a relationship. Um, There's some research that shows it's age dependent. Uh, We did a study of 6,000, actually Dr. Megan Moreno, who's at University of Wisconsin, um, and she's a pediatrician, 
Um, she led the study, 6,000 young people and their parents, and she looked at their media habits, their physical habits, their mental health habits, um, their parental relationships, and she looked, decided to see out of these 6,000 people, um, young people, how what was the relationship between their media use and mental and physical health, and what we did, she, and where did you know kids fall out? Two thirds of the kids, no matter how much media they used, they were totally fine. No problem. They were using social media. They were using all sorts of different things. One third of the kids who used a lot of media, they were at risk. They were not doing well. And what she found were the markers of their that that sort of differentiated these two parents, parental communication, parents who had strict time limits, had kids who were turning out worse than parents who had strict content limits. So in some ways that tells you a parent that's talking to their child, who's talking to them about content. Parents who um, were on social media a lot, they had worse, those kids had worse outcomes than the parents who were not on social media a lot. Um, having family owned devices was a better sort of, um, you know, model for, for children than having a whole bunch of individual devices. Um, so, you know, so there were, there were all these other things that were probably influencing because media in and of itself was not the thing that was determining the mental health and physical health of these kids. It was these other factors. And that's what most of the relationship, when you say correlation, not causation, what you mean is yeah. there's a relationship and we see, okay, I use a lot of social media and I'm going to feel worse. Um, but maybe before that I was really depressed and that's why I was on social media or I was really insecure. You don't know what the underlying causes are. Um, One worth. of the things we want to do is help kids actually notice how they feel when they use different apps and notice if they're getting what they came for. So if I want to feel better and relax and I scroll some TikTok and it doesn't make me feel that way, it would be great to have the internal knowledge to notice like, oh, this isn't actually de-stressing me as much as when I go for a run, right? And so just starting to work with kids to help them really be able to notice this app makes me feel kind of competitive with others, but this app is actually pretty fun or the content or experiences I tend to have when I join this kind of like discord and game with my friends might be a more positive experience. But when I just scroll YouTube shorts, I don't tend to have as positive an experience. Now that takes a lot of self-knowledge. And I think a lot of adults, I, I would include myself, sometimes go to social media expecting to feel better and end up feeling worse, right? And so I do think in the short term, we can help kids notice their experience. Um, but but absolutely the research, you know, what, what y'all is saying about the research is what I have seen as well. And I, I put in the, in the chat, but I see it's only going to host and panelists, a study with Candace Odgers, that says much the same thing, you know, differential vulnerabilities. Many, many kids are very resilient when it comes to even the potential harms of social media, some of the things we worry about the most. Um, and a lot of kids are very savvy about, for example, like a lot of us worry about body image. Many kids told me that they intentionally curate their feed to have body positive people to follow, that they, you know, turn off things that they feel like are pro diet culture, et cetera. But if you have a kid with a pre existing ED, eating disorder, would I be more concerned about that kid on even Pinterest, y'all? Pinterest has a lot of like diet culture stuff and diet culture, by the way, for children is, is toxic. I mean, I'm going to say for all of us, but for young people, it's absolutely poison. Like no, no kid should be learning about how to eat or work out on the internet, full stop. That is not the place to learn about that stuff. Um, and so, cause it's so, it's so, and anything that's even positive fitness wise is so close and adjacent to diet culture. That's toxic that it's not safe, but, and so whether it's Pinterest, whether it's Instagram, whatever, whether it's TikTok, all of that is tricky, but for many, many kids, it is okay. Your kid who is totally fine is not necessarily going to like go on Instagram and immediately, you know, get an eating disorder or feel competitive with their classmates on another front. Um, if they're already vulnerable on that front, could it exacerbate it? We need to inoculate kids on that by giving them media literacy, by supporting them in school and at home, by talking about whether it's unrealistic body images, whether we're talking about mainstream media in Hollywood and TV, or whether we're talking about what other people post and filtration. And again, that's just one, one issue, but I think it's one that we understandably worry about. It's Frances Haugen, when she blew the whistle about Facebook meta, like brought that one up. Um, I see a lot of kids intentionally working their social media 
around that stuff though. And so I think we can help kids enjoy the benefits of being connected to others without being as vulnerable to some of the the potential harms. Yeah. And I really, really love that. I mean, it's all about conversation. Right? And I know they can make it so hard for us to have conversation with them, but we can make it hard for them to have conversation with us because we are always so focused on, oh, you've got to get good grades. You've got to get enough sleep. You know, like we are not just sitting down and listening and and absorbing and talking and exploring their media lives. And the more you do that, the more they might open up and conversation and really thinking about, I love the fact um, or what Devorah was saying about, you know, how does that make you feel? Like, you know, getting them to think about, you know, oh, that makes me really feel insecure. I don't really like the way that person said that thing then they'll start making those choices. You know, I mean, they, this is, you can't control anyone else and you really can't control your kids. So the more you can get them to think for themselves around their tech and media use, the better. Thank you both. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk a moment about these apps and the content creators that and companies like Meta that are, often criticized for what they're curating on their sites and now Twitter, which is now X, <laughs> X and, you know, and Facebook and Instagram, all these different apps. I mean, I know y'all do you work with some of the content creators. What responsibility do they take to what they are putting, allowing to be on their sites? I mean, you know, I came from industry, so I have a lot of empathy for that middle manager who is trying their best to do the right thing, probably like a Francis Haugen, and and having the forces above who are very focused on shareholders and bottom line sort of discount it. And um, I, you know, I think that they probably all need to take way more responsibility. And and I wish their data was you know, they gave us access to their data. I wish that they were, you know, really careful about who actually came onto their sites. I, I think you can identify, and some of them are trying to do this. I do know even Instagram is trying to do this. You can identify more vulnerable youth. And, and I wish that for the vulnerable youth, we had a better way to support them. And we were able to do that. Um, th I used to think you could motivate these people with carrots um, not sticks, which is what we do at the center. I do think they need to be shamed too. I do think they wouldn't, you know, I mean, it, without the sort of threat of legislation and the threat of, you know, parents saying we need some changes, I don't know if industry would change. So I think you need both. I think you need to be working to sort of make these people, especially at the top, because the only thing that's going to make Mark Zuckerberg pay any attention to this stuff is is somebody saying you know we're going to sue you we're going to close this down we're going to you know but then you've got to work with those people in the middle who are really actually want to have you know they care more and and help them figure and understand their business model because a lot of times their job is to get people engaged you know their job is to get eyeballs and thumbs on these things um but at the same time they nobody wants to have a child that has a negative, you know, experience in in terms of their mental health. So, oh, I mean, I think when the guy from Instagram was talking about his daughter getting dick pics, that was a great example of like, yeah, that was a wake up call for him because he'd been on the app and he didn't have the experience of being a teen girl on the app. And I've had girls show me their phones and the kinds of DMs teenage girls routinely get on yeah. Snapchat, on Instagram, and it's gross, y'all. If you haven't seen it. <laughs> I don't so ever want to see that. <laughs> yeah, it's but it's it's worth talking to kids about that. And a lot of kids are like, oh, whatever. It's like the price of doing business. And I don't think it should be. Um, and how do we balance the the rights that we all want to have to privacy? I mean, I don't have a good answer because I also am concerned about age verification and I'm really concerned about parental controls. Um, I wrote on my Substack um a lot about why I think the Utah law and some of the other parental control laws are very dangerous to children who are LGBTQ plus, who are being abused, who are vulnerable in a number of other ways. Um, because that law tends to assume that everybody has parents who are absolutely supportive and out to support them. Well, that's not the case. Not every kid even has parents full stop period. Like that's, you know, not every kid has parents. 
So if you're going to say like mm. only kids who have parents get to have Instagram, well, what about kids who don't have parents? Right. Like that doesn't work. So, or that kids should be 18 before they should be able to use these apps independently, but in a state that says they can get married and have a job when they're 16, like using social media is a big responsibility, but I'm going to say driving a car, getting married and having a job are bigger. Right. And so we just have a very confused relationship as a society to like what it means to be part of a digital community. And we could all be doing more to help kids have good experiences and learn how to be members of digital community. Um, I think you just froze, Devorah. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about this information online, what we can do. So there was a study, you know, body image is an issue um, for so many people, me too. Um, and, you know, so it happened to me long before social media was happening. So it's something that's been around and social media didn't invent. But there was a study where they um, in, put into people's feeds, to young girls' feeds, um, you know, basically body positivity images, different kinds of people. And within two weeks, it shifted the way they thought about their bodies. So I think really trying to think and talk to your child about, you know, could trying to follow a variety of people, not just one little cookie cutter model. Um, you know, somebody said about working with, you know, going through the feeds and talking about some of the negative, because there's so much negativity. We're all bombarded with like thinking the world is falling apart when actually, you know, many markers, it's doing better than we think. Um, you know, so really talking to them about making a having variety in their feed. And frankly, I kind of wish the algorithm would do that too, rather than just send, you know, you know, you're, I'm interested in this topic and I'm going to get more and more images on that topic. I wish that the, the social media companies would provide a little bit more variety in our feeds. And I do think they are working on it. I am on the YouTube kids and family council, and we've been working with them for five years um, you know, a whole bunch of developmental psychologists, many I'm sure you know, Devora, that we've been working with them to try to um, get them to think about how they, inter you know, do things for young people and they're doing some good work. So I think that's, um, that's important. I know we need to wrap up and I'm very drawn into some of these questions. I wonder if we can take it. Me too. Minute, but, um, one question here is, you know, adults are worried that they don't know enough about social media. What's a good way for adults to get informed and learn? And one way is to have your kid or an older kid in your family, like say you have nieces or nephews who are in their twenties or in their teens, like have them show you some stuff, um, have people in the industry show you things like I have I'm not a big gamer. So I always go to my industry friends when I want to know about gaming questions um, just really be not afraid to ask, because I think one of the challenges with the ways that digital life for our kids is so stigmatized is we're like not supposed to admit to other parents that our kids like have a Nintendo or are on Discord or have ever heard of YouTube. And of course they all have, but we don't talk about it the way we talk about other things. So going to the parents of kids who are a bit older than your kid and saying, what do you wish you knew before they got on Snapchat? Or what do you wish that you knew before you greenlit this or that? These are great ways in. And, and honestly, like I said, older young people in your family, like if you have a good relationship with a college student in your family, and maybe you have a middle school student, that college student could be a huge resource for you on like, tell me about YouTube shorts or <laughs> give me some insight on this particular YouTuber. Or, you know, should, should, should our 12 year old be spending time with this? And then as we talk about content, like Yalda, you mentioned the, the research that said content is important kids get very excited about the content they love. And we do have to pick our battles with content. Some of the content my 14 year old loves, I don't love, but I don't think it's harmful, right? The stuff that I think is harmful, that's where I'll really intervene. So I think it's important to pick your battles with kids and not intervene on everything. Like if they want to watch squirrels run through mazes and you don't think it's the highest and best use of their time, but it's not hurting them. Like, but if they're or following they someone watch a kid who, gaming. I yeah, it's like watch a, well, watch, watch, a my child gaming. watch a gamer on YouTube. And I was like, what? <laughs> Let's talk about that though. Like how can we help kids understand that we want them to take what they learn from that and use it in their own gaming, but we don't want them to predominantly do passive viewing, but some viewing makes sense. Just like people watch the world cup or people watch, you know, the world series. Uh, but we might have a preference about how much time. And also for younger users, some of those gaming channels might have language we don't like or something. So if you've got like a third grader, for example, <laughs> you know, that the gaming channels they watch, you want to kind of attend to like which gaming channels and is this an appropriate one for my eight-year-old? How do I feel about? I mean, the one thing that I always try to do with my kids and 
you know, and I've, I've got my PhD. I watch my kids doing this. I've learned through, my kids are now 21 and 24. Um, I've learned through trial and error, but I always try to, when I'm judging them and I'm thinking something that they're doing is, is what I try to apply it to is, is this so different than what I grew up with my child or the way that I relate to my media. I, my books, my movies, my TV. Okay. My child's on social media. My child's on gaming. You know, one time my, my son said we were, we were, um, on, in a, on an Island that was actually developed by a video game designer. And so he knew that this video game that he played, he knew that the, um, video, he knew the landscape and he was like, this reminds me, oh yeah, I did this. You know, I was here before. And I was like, oh my God, he thinks video games are reality. And then I was like, well, I got, I watch a movie about Paris. And then I'm like, oh yeah, I remember this when I go to Paris. So just always just sort of questioning your gut reaction of judging them. And is it really so different? Was it really so different for you? And I know we are way over time. <laughs> That's such an interesting perspective, really, to think that way and think, is it really so different? And that's, Something that I think we can all muse upon and um, think very seriously about. Um, we are out of time, but I want to thank you both so much. I think Marianne sums this up just perfectly by thanking you for your superb discussion of what she calls digital wisdom. And I love that. Um, you've given us a lot of wisdom this evening about our digital world and the digital world that our youth are are living in so thank you so much for that and thank you everybody who's been on this program for the privilege of your time um it is our last open mind of 2023 hard to believe um and i would be remiss if i didn't make a little fundraising pitch since it is year end i hope that those of you who attend the open mind on a regular basis will consider supporting us in your year-end giving. Um, I want to wish everybody a meaningful and peaceful and healthy holiday season and new year. And we look forward to learning much more in 2024. And thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Yalda.